Come here. A little, a little closer. closer. Come on. Uh, oh. Back it up. Back it up. Back it up. <laughs> right there. Right there. Welcome to New at LLU. I'm Mish. And I'm Abby. And we have some exciting things coming up this week, like Campus Com tonight at 7. And if you aren't able to make it in person, check it out on the live stream. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested in being a CGL, do not forget the interest meeting on February 9th. SGA is inviting you to the State of the University Address on Thursday, February 9th. Yeah, you'll hear from our student body president and other SGA leaders to find out how student government is advocating for not only our campus, but also our students. And this will be at the School of Business Towns Auditorium. Do not miss it. Jordi Searcy is in the La Haye event space on February 10th at 8 p.m. One of our students, Kaylee Dishman, will be opening for Jordi, so make sure you grab a friend and enjoy a great night of some amazing music. Do you want to travel the world? Summer LU Centrips is taking applications right now. But you need to hurry because application deadline is tonight. For any questions, you can stop by the LU Send office or email lusend at liberty.edu. Mish, did you hear a women's basketball team is going up against Jacksonville State tomorrow? No way. Yeah. I'm going to be there. I, you got, I'm going to be there. You are? Yeah. Okay. Definitely. <laughs> we have our Every Square Inch conference coming up February 9th through the 10th. Mm -hmm. This conference will be focusing on theology and culture and help you build your community and your faith. Abby, did you know that Student Activities is hosting the Y2K Trivia Night on February 3rd? I actually did. It's at the La Haye event space at 9 p.m. So while we promote a lot of what happens on campus, we want to see you and your friends from your perspective. Yeah, we do. Text video to 839-858 and upload some of your favorite campus memories. Well, that's all that's new. Enjoy your day at LU. <laughs>
Jesus, the Son of God, shall reign. Oh, praise Him.
So you remember last fall, we had Greg and Kathy Laurie talking about this movie. They were here in Convo and talking about how it was going to be released this spring. Well, it's coming out in a couple of weeks, but tomorrow night, Thursday night, at 7 o'clock over at Thomas Road Baptist Church is the world premiere of that movie. And Lionsgate Film is going to be showing that film in its entirety there at Thomas Road tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. Jonathan Rumi that you saw in that uh, movie clip, the trailer there, also plays Jesus in The Chosen. He will be there in the room introducing the film. He'll be answering questions, taking pictures, talking to people. Love to have you come over tomorrow night and to be a part of that. Starts at 7 o'clock. The doors open at 6 o'clock. And we're excited to see what God does through this movie as it takes the message of the gospel into movie theaters all across the country. And so let's be praying about that. And then on Friday... Jonathan Rumi, John Irwin, and others from the Jesus Revolution will be here in Convo as well. And so you'll have the opportunity of hearing from them. So it's going to be a great, great week. But hey, before we keep rolling, let's pray today that God blesses our time together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. God, we're grateful for your love. We're grateful for salvation. We're grateful for the cross, for the empty tomb. God, we're grateful for your word. And we're grateful that through all that you continue to do in the lives of believers all around the world, God, that you are continuing to grow the kingdom of God. We thank you for the church that you continue to build. And we pray, Lord, that you would allow each and every one of us to find the place that we have to serve within the context of reaching the world with the gospel and that we would be faithful in that calling. God, I pray that you would bless our time together today as we open your word, speak to us, grow us, Lord, help us to see you at work in this room so that we, Lord, can walk out of here enthused, excited about doing what you've called us to do. And God, for that, we give you the praise, we give you the glory, and all that you are going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we're excited to have Mark Dever. He's the pastor of Capitol Hill Baptist Church up in Washington, D.C. And he uh, formerly was on the divinity faculty at the University of Cambridge in England. And he's doing some incredible things in ministry, incredible things there in Washington, D.C. Like one of the bright spots in our nation's capital certainly is what Mark is continuing to do. He also leads a ministry that uh, reaches out to pastors around called Nine Marks. And we're excited to have Mark Dever here today. So let's give him a big Liberty welcome and welcome him to the stage. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, friends. It's good to be with you again today. I was here a few years ago. And uh, don't forget speaking to a group like this in the round, which I don't normally do. So it's always exciting to be able to think of how you're uh, hearing and seeing what I'm saying. But you're used to it. You do this every week. If you were up here speaking, you're going to speak to five or 10,000 people who are 20 years old, around 20 years old. What would you want to say? Well, I'm going to say three very simple things. Number one, trust Jesus alone for salvation. Number two, join a church. Number three, join a good church. That's it. That's all I plan on doing. And I'm going to try to get you guys to help me maybe with a few of these points. First, the first one about Jesus. Trust Jesus alone for your salvation. Uh, I trust here at Liberty you have heard this message. Maybe you hear it every time you get together. But I just want to make sure that you understand that you are made in the image of God. Every single person on this planet is made specifically to reflect something of the glory of the God who made him. Uh, we are called to be able to act in a way that he acts. God is a relational being. He treats others with justice and with love, with goodness and with mercy. So we're supposed to do that. Now, the problem is none of us have done that as we should. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, didn't, and none of us have since then. And so therefore, because God is good, he will punish us. But in his great mercy, he sent his only son to live a truly human life and then die on the cross in the place of every one of us who would ever turn from our sins and trust in him to take God's justice, his good wrath upon him in our place. God raised him from the dead. He ascended to heaven. The book of Hebrews tells us he presented that sacrifice to his heavenly father who accepted it on all of our behalf if we turn and trust in him. And so he calls each one of us to turn and trust in him. Now that message, I'm assuming, is the basic message that your education here is based on. 
I'm assuming that's the basic message that your life is based on if you're a Christian. I assume that you've got a way that you share that good news with other people regularly. I pray that you do. Uh, you will not always be in a room full of five or 10,000 Christians. Uh, you will very often find yourself, if the Lord gives you life, in places where you may be one of the few, if not the only one, who knows and believes the truth about Jesus Christ. So you wanna get familiar with that message. Uh, I try to make sure in our church that everyone in our congregation can articulate that message in 60 seconds or less. We ask people when they join the church, how do you know that you're a Christian? What does it mean to be a Christian? How do you find forgiveness for your sins? And we ask them to be able to share that briefly. So I would encourage you to be able to do that as well. Maybe in some break today, just try to share that with a good friend of yours. Make sure you've got that message clear. Assuming that message is clear, I wanna go on to talk for a few minutes about what you should do once you personally follow Christ. And this is what I think a lot of people forget today, that I'm thankful for what I've heard Jonathan and others say about how liberty encourages you to be involved in a local church. So part of my argument with a lot of modern evangelical Christians in America today is they think of Christianity simply as a, a private religion. It's what I think inside. And I think I understand what people mean by that, but I would put it just slightly differently. And that's what I said for the, the title of this message that we follow Jesus personally, but not alone. I wondered if you've noticed this. So much of the New Testament makes no sense if you think of you being the only Christian. So much of the New Testament only comes together when you begin understanding how Jesus calls his disciples to live together. So for example, if you open your Bibles, in a few minutes I'm gonna ask you to help me find some things in scripture, but if you open your Bibles to Matthew 16, Matthew chapter 16, this is the famous section where Peter confesses Jesus as the Christ. Look there down in verse 18. After Jesus has confessed that, after rather Peter's confessed that Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus then says, I tell you, you are Peter. This is Matthew 10, 18. And on this rock, that is the rock of Peter's confession of who Jesus is, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So that's interesting. He means to be telling Peter that he will be a part of a church. Church, friends, is an assembly. That's what the word means in the Greek. If you go to Acts 18, there's a riot in Ephesus, and then they all church. They assemble in the amphitheater there at Ephesus. Uh, that was just a secular Greek word. It meant assembly. But what that meant is that Peter was not gonna be the only one confessing Jesus as the Messiah. And in fact, he wasn't. Uh, Peter became the first of, of many, of, of tens and then hundreds and then thousands, even in the first few months after Christ's resurrection, who confessed Jesus as the Christ. And what we find happening is not merely individuals following Jesus, but we find individuals following Jesus together in the local church. The pattern for this is set in that very first sermon in Acts chapter two. If you look over at Acts chapter two, verses 38 and following, we find that when Peter preaches the truth about why Jesus had just been killed. He'd been killed as a sacrifice. When they heard this, we read in Acts 2, 37, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. With this and many other words, he bore witness and continued the exhortation saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his words were baptized and there were added that day about 3000 souls. And then you keep going in verses 42 in the rest of the chapter and they describe this fellowship of the Christians there in Jerusalem. So friend, I don't know how long you've been a Christian, 
Maybe you grew up in a Christian home and you can never remember a day when you weren't trusting in Christ. Uh, maybe you've only come to Christ recently. Maybe it was through a high school ministry or a friend. Maybe it was through a church at home. But I hope you've understood that part of what it means for you to follow Jesus is to be a part of a specific group of people who are also following Jesus, part of a local church. If you go over to the book of Galatians chapter five, Galatians chapter five, you have the fruit of the spirit laid out there. Sometimes people wonder, how can I know whether or not I'm a Christian? And I've had, I remember when I first got to um, the church that I was in, it was small and elderly members, sweet people. Uh, there's this one older member who's in the church office with me one time and she just looked at me and she said, I don't think you think I'm a Christian. I had never said anything like that to her. I, I didn't, I, I don't, well, no comment, but I, uh, I'd never said anything like that to her. And I said, what, what do you mean? And she said, and she just kept talking. She said, I can remember it as clear as it was yesterday. I had this book of colors. My sins were as black as could be, but the red blood of Jesus covered them. And now I'm forgiven and I'm cleansed and made pure as the white snow. And so I have the golden hope of heaven in front of me. Well, I said, and she said, I can remember praying that prayer as if it were yesterday. And I said to her, I called her by name and I said, listen, the Bible nowhere tells us to try to remember a time when we prayed a prayer to know whether or not we're a Christian. Paul instructs us very clearly in Galatians 5, we're to look at our lives. And in Galatians 5, he lays out the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. You look there at 5, 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. These things I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, that is what the Holy Spirit produces in your life, if you're His, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's very interesting that almost all of those fruit are things you would not see if you were alone on a desert island. Almost all of those fruit have to do with how you interact with others. And of course, that reflects in the character of God. Like we said at the beginning, you were made to reflect God's character. God is a relational being. So you've been made to be a relational being. So I'm wondering if you're talking to a friend and they say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I don't really see the need to go to church. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Where would you go to in scripture to try to help them understand? No, you should be following Jesus with others in a local church. And here I'm asking you to open your Bibles or check your phone app, your Bible apps on your phone, however you do it. Uh, and what would be a good idea of a verse or a passage to go to to show that you need to regularly as a Christian be a part of a local church? This is not a rhetorical question. He, Hebrews 10, 35. I think you mean Hebrews 10, 25. Just check it in your Bible, let me know. Well, well, no, wait, hold on, hold on. I'm dealing with Hebrews 10 right now. So stand up if you said the Hebrews 10 reference. Thank you. What's your name? Avery Carter. Hey, Avery. Uh, did you, Avery? Did you check your verse? Yeah, read us Hebrews 10 25. I can hear you, they can hear you. Great reference. I think Avery's hit. <laughs> Avery, I, I think that's maybe the best single verse you could go to uh, to make this point. Uh, don't neglect the assembly together as is the habit of some. But uh, there is other stuff. Who's got something else to be good? Oh, Acts 242, thank you. What's your name? Emma, that was just where we were going to, you know, we're reading just a moment ago. If I'd gone just the next verse, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers. Yeah, excellent. Acts 2.42. You might want to write these down. You may have some friends you need to argue with about this a little bit later today. 
So Hebrews 10, 25, 24 and 25, 23, 24, 25 is actually good. Acts 2, 42 and following. Somebody else. These are two really good passages. Hold on, I got Psalm 130. I love the Bible references. Right here though, who? Stand up. What's your name? Thomas. Thomas. Psalm, Psalm 131, one. You wanna read that to us? Yeah. How good and pleasant it is. Where are you? Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah. How good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Ah, uh, okay. I mean, it's, no, it's, it's certainly true, but I'm just thinking if I'm arguing with somebody trying to prove, they could say I do that in a small group or I have some good friends or like the Baptist dude shouldn't argue with the Presbyterian dude. There's all lots of things you could do with that one. It's a great verse, I love the verse. I think for this argument, I'm going with Acts 2 and Hebrews 10. Anybody else, other ideas? Wait, I'm gonna start over here because they started first. What's your name? Ron, stand up. Pe people are very pleased with Ron. Okay, so Ron, what book? What? Okay, so I'm 122 verse one. Let's go to the house of the Lord, yep. Okay, Old Testament, yes, he's referring to the temple. We can do that by good hermeneutics, yep. But I can imagine somebody saying Jesus clears, he fulfills the food laws. So I don't, I'm sticking with the New Testament, I think, for arguing for the church specifically. Though both the Psalms references are good supporting, it's not gonna be the sharp point of the spear. Somebody else. Wait, I've had this one a couple of times. Stand up. Your name? Summer. Wait, Summer's going to be quoting Ephesians. It says, He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. All right. So you're doing Ephesians 4 15 and 16. So if you're writing it down, Ephesians 4 15 and 16, I think that's an excellent one. Be well, because you see how, let's just say Summer alone was following Jesus, she literally could not obey that verse. There'd be nobody to do it with. You have to have a group of people. Let me just argue a little bit more that the group of people you need to have is a specific group of people. I was talking once to some pastors in India and they were actually skeptical of this idea of formal designated church membership. And I could tell it was a problem for them because of some heritage they had. And so I thought, okay, 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 let's scrap this word membership. And I, and I felt like, okay, this is gonna be like talking to a Jehovah's Witness about the Trinity. I need to just reconstruct the idea from the New Testament without using the word. I said, okay, let's have, a, I got a whiteboard. I said, let's have a pyramid up here. And let's say I've got a particular Christian, okay, you. And then let's say I have a particular pastor or group of pastors, and I have a particular gathering of Christians. Now, I think the New Testament is full of commands that tell us as individual Christians how we are to relate to a certain pastor or pastors. Hebrews 13, 17, obey your leaders. Uh, that certainly can't mean all pastors, that would just mean yours. Or Galatians 2, share all good things with him who teaches you the word. First Corinthians 9 says something similar. So there's all kinds of things the New Testament has to tell us what a Christian is to do for a particular pastor or pastors. And also what a Christian is to do for a particular meeting of Christians. So the Hebrews 10 one that's so good that Avery had. Well, if you look, he says to consider how you can stir one another up to love and good works. So he's not just thinking about all Christians everywhere. He's thinking about a particular group of Christians you know that you could consider how to stir them up for their good. So there's gonna be a regular meeting with these people that you have. So we see that and we can find more commands like this. You could do this in your 
uh, get a piece of paper and just put these three dots on here and start filling it in with commands. There are also responsibilities that a pastor has for each individual Christian in his church and for the church as a whole. You can find commands for this. So I'm, I'm gonna give a, a stricter account to God according to James 3.1, because I teach his word. And I'm gonna be particularly accountable, not for you guys, uh, though I'm appreciative of you, but I'm gonna give account specifically for the members of my church. Uh, normally I keep my membership directory up in my Bible, but I didn't want it to fall out while I was up here, so I gave it to Ryan who's with me. But uh, I normally keep a membership directory of the members of the Capitol Hill Baptist Church. So I don't understand myself in the last day to be giving a special account for you guys. No offense. Uh, I do understand myself to be giving a special account for the members of my church. Uh, so I think your pastor will be giving to the Lord a special accounting for you on that day. So that's a special responsibility the pastor has for each individual Christian in it and for that assembly of Christians. Uh, but you know, the assembly also has a responsibility for each member of it and for the pastors of it. You can see this in lots of places. One interesting place to go to is 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. Paul is writing to Timothy. He's saying the teaching is going to go bad in the future in the Ephesian church. And when he's saying that, he says in chapter 2, 2 Timothy, chapter 4, rather, verse 3, the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. That's interesting because Paul has already said very clearly in 1 Timothy 3 that it's, it's a noble task to aspire to be an elder, an overseer, a teacher of God's word. But James warns us in James 3 verse 1, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with a greater strictness. So for you to stand and teach God's word publicly, you are asking for extra attention both from the devil and from God. And I think you'll get both. But it's interesting when Paul writes to Timothy here, he is telling them that it's not only the teachers who bear that responsibility, but it's the people who pay them to teach what their itching ears want to hear. Do you know why there are bad Christian colleges that teach false things? because there are customers who will pay for that. Do you know why there are bad churches littered all around this country? Because there are people who go to them. There are people who pay the salaries of those people to say those things. It's part of the responsibility the members of the congregation have is for what's preached. It's not just the responsibility of the preacher, it's also the responsibility of those who are listening to it, who appear to give heed to it by attending regularly at it. So please understand what I'm saying. Trust in Christ alone for your salvation. Part of trusting in Christ truly and normally is being a member of a local church. But you should not just be a member of a local church, you should be a member of a good local church. Friends, how do you tell what a good church is? Well, how do you tell what a true church is? At the Reformation, that question came up. Uh, are all of these Roman Catholic churches around us here in Europe true Christian churches? And the standard again and again in the Bible that all the reformers found was to be a true church. Does anybody know what the answer is? They said two things you have to have. Say what? Did you say love? That's a great thing to have through the spirit. It's not two of the distinguishing signs. I'm not sure they want to say no Roman Catholics had, had love. So, so they're, they're wanting to say there are two things that were marks of the church. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. That is an excellent answer. And that's basically their first and most important answer. They said the right preaching of God's word, which will mean preach the gospel. Who said that? What's your name? Audrey, you're to be highly commended for that answer. That is, uh, Audrey, what you just said, that was the Protestant Reformation. That was it, the, the, what the gospel is and they should preach it. All right, so preaching the, the word of God, rightly preaching the Bible, rightly preaching the gospel particularly. But then what was the other mark they said? Unity, nope, that was one of the marks of a, of a 
the church that we're talking about as characteristics in the early church. I've got to have somebody say, say it more loudly. And you, somebody has to know this here. Ordinances. Ordinances. Who said that? Uh, Avery? <laughs> Avery Carter? Avery, do you want to stand up? So Avery, right preaching of the word of God and and right administration of the ordinances, carefully said in historically Baptist school ordinances. Um, yes, the sacraments, the baptism and the Lord's Supper. So right administration of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Now, right immediately when you say that, evangelical Christians sometimes go, oh no, then you can't get along together over baptism if somebody does infant baptism and somebody does believer baptism. Well, I would just say the right administration of baptism and the Lord's Supper means most fundamentally that you realize that doing those things will not save you. Faith alone in Christ saves you. Baptism and the Lord's Supper reflect that salvation brought to us by Jesus Christ. So that's the right administration that an evangelical Presbyterian and an evangelical Baptist can agree on, that we understand that this will not save a person but that a saved person will, in obedience to the rightly preached word of God, rightly do what Jesus said and remember him in the feast, in the Lord's Supper, and follow him in the example of baptism. So that's it, that, that's what marks off a true church. But now it's interesting, I just use that language marks off. What do I mean by that? Part of what the church needs to do, if it's to be a good church, is not only to bring you God's word, to teach you God's word, regularly. So the way I'm speaking to you now is not how I normally preach in our church. Uh, in our church, uh, I preach through portions of scripture. So right now I'm in a series on Job chapter three. We're doing a brief three-part series in Job three as he laments over what's just happened to his family. But that's the, the way that I as a pastor try to equip God's people with God's word, both the message of it and so they see how to understand it and study it and read it themselves. That's what you want to see, I think, in a good church. Normally, expositional preaching, that is not what I'm doing right now. Right now I'm taking a topic and I'm just unfolding it to you guys, trusting you're getting your normal good meals at your church on Sunday. But I am just giving you this as a little added vitamin supplement to try to help you see, yes, this is in fact, self-consciously, I should be trusting Christ alone for my salvation. I should not just do that myself, but I should join a local church formally. I mean, let them know I'm here, I'm praying for you. I'm gonna be here regularly. If you don't see me here, come after me. Get involved in my, and you should join a good local church. That is a local church where the word of God is regularly preached. And part of it would be where the local church cares that you're a member. Some churches today are a little bit like stationary Billy Graham rallies. They don't care a lot who's there as much as how many are there. I think if you're in a good church, they're gonna care that you are there. They're gonna be the kind of church that wants to see you in particular profit, profit and grow in your own spiritual life. In our local church, we do that imperfectly. Uh, we are by DC standards, a larger church in that we have hundreds of members. You know, most churches in America have 60, 70, 80 members. Uh, we, we have several hundred members. So it's a little harder for us to keep track of everybody, but we try to encourage a culture of discipling where all of us are caring for one another, where we do the Hebrews 10, 24, 25, you know, work to consider how you can stir one another up to love and good deeds. And so we have a prayer meeting on Sunday evening where most of our members come back and we pray and we pray particularly for things that are going on in the church. It's interesting when you look at God's plan to save the fallen world, he calls his people Israel and he calls them to be distinct because he wants to show the truth about himself by having a people set apart. Friends, that's what's going on in the New Testament, in the church. We are called to be distinct from the world around us. We're called to be people who are full of the fruit of God's spirit, who reflect love and, and unity with our brothers and sisters. We're those who are called 
to understand and to live out. As Jesus said in the Great Commission, to observe all, that is to obey all that he's commanded us. Uh, we want hearts with, full of God's love, minds full of God's truth. We want our, our lips and our lives, our doctrine and our devotion truly given to the Lord. And we want to do that in the context of a particular group of people. Friends, you can take the commands in the New Testament about how you should behave as a Christian. You can take them as a general marching order to you about how you interact with everybody you see throughout the week, and that's okay. But you should also take them particularly as a command how you interact with this particular group of people that you see regularly, under whose ministry of the word you sit, for whom you have uh, a responsibility and they have a responsibility to you. That's why you have to somehow formally make that known to them, the preacher, the ministers, but also to each other, the other members of the church, as you agree together with them to serve the Lord together. That's what we want to do in our local churches. That's how we can do these very things that are set out uh, in the verses we thought of, Hebrews 10, 23 to 25. If we just go to Ephesians here at the very end, go to Ephesians chapter 2. This is what Paul's envisioning when he writes the Ephesians. He says in 219, so then you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone and in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. When I was in Cambridge in England studying I had an American friend come with a, a parachurch ministry that does evangelism on college campuses. He was a great guy, loved the Lord, intense, memorized the Bible, amazing soccer player. He'd grown up in Austria. And one day we were walking along and he came to the same church that I was at. And I said, John, why do you always just come right in time for the sermon? I said, you never come for the beginning of the service. You never get here for like the scripture reading and the prayer and the hymns. He said, well, I don't get anything out of all that stuff. Uh, I come for the preaching. And I said, well, did you ever think of, of joining the church? And he looked at me like I had three heads. He said, join the church? He said, why would I join the church? I know what I'm here to do. I'm here to evangelize and disciple students. If I join arms with those people, they may slow me down. Now, I got to tell you, John is an awesome brother. He loves the Lord Jesus. He lived an amazing life then and has continued to since then. So he's not a shallow Christian or a carnal dude, but this was his thinking at this point. And I just said to him when he said, if I join arms with all those people, they may slow me down. I said, John, did you ever think that you locking arms with all those people may slow you down, but you may help to speed them up and that God may care more about the whole than just about you? So much more we could say about this. I want you to use your Bibles to help each other understand why you should be a member of a good local church where the Bible is preached and where people help take responsibility for each other's personal discipleship, their lives following Christ. That's part of your job as a Christian, to love the brothers and sisters that you meet with every week. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for the way you've provided for us in your church. We pray that you'd help each one of us to be obedient ourselves and to help our brothers and sisters be obedient to this. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Do you feel the world is broken? 
keep from getting through we do do you wish that we could see it all made new it's all creation groaning is a new creation coming Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Yeah. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? So guys, make sure you come back tonight, 7 o'clock, Campus Community, PJ Preston will be opening God's Word tonight. Bring your books with you. We continue our study in the book of James. God bless you and have a great, great day.